afternoon all thought I'd go over myself and open round five game so my opponent in this round was Marek Velsic and I think he was underrated again about 160 ECF but um, uh, in the five minute uh, tournament the day before you know he was quite a challenge in, in round one of that uh, blitz uh, between rounds so I thought how does his game change on, on the longer time limit okay he surprised me with one b3 I use now a system which my good friend Alex Aflantis has recommended to me in the past e5 uh, with the idea of blocking in that bishop soon after bishop b2 to simply play knight c6 and to be prepared for the further assaults now on e5 coming up uh, when white plays bishop b5 soon to try and add further weight to e5 pressure uh, to simply here first play knight f6 and after bishop b5 simply play bishop d6 so the idea is uh, to encourage white to capture uh, so even though you get double pawns you get this bishop developed and the central control is quite good the semi open d file pressure might be useful okay my opponent here played the move now in this position which surprised me a little he played d4 and this is only move five and I drifted off in some variations here I thought hold on a sec if I take and he takes and I visualize something like this that surely I just castle here and this would make knight f3 look silly because then there's rook e8 check what is he going to do retreat back the bishop that doesn't look right and if he plays knight e2 I was looking forward in this position to something like knight g4 when this looks really dangerous white can't even castle kingside so I did wonder was this d4 actually right so I was looking forward to something like that and I took the pawn on d4 and again surprisingly he took on c6 here instead of recapturing the pawn and again I, I drifted off into some variations here I thought hold on I don't necessarily have to just recapture this and allow taking at leisure with either piece I can frame bishop b4 check here so I had a quick look at bishop b4 check and in my mind's eye I thought what, what is going on here isn't this a really uh, dangerous check and I thought well you know knight d2 maybe takes here maybe the bishop moves now I take on d2 you know th this can't be right this can't be opening theory um, and also you know what does what does white play there for and I thought well maybe you know c3 uh, I could take and so say he takes and I kind of visualize this position without really going into much depth here of the difference between this position and the pawn on d4 and also I thought hang on what if what if white just plays king f1 as another alternative and okay then then I take care then you know maybe this this bishops you know a liability so maybe this bishop before wasn't that good and I sort of convinced myself that actually you know in this position I've just got this opportunity to play the move I wanted to play is just to liberate this bishop I remember in the previous round a bit of a nightmare with this bishop being really bad I thought why don't I just play more simply here instead of bishop b4 check just play d takes c6 and the thing is so I played d takes c6 so it was quite early in the game and I think we'd only used a few minutes each at this point after queen takes d4 I suddenly thought you know actually <laughs> actually why why on earth didn't I consider Bishop b4 check more um, because it looked as though now I've given up a golden opportunity to sort of smash up you know White's pawn structure or, or stop him castling and it seems actually in this position that if I routinely castle now I'm walking into this kind of dangerous battery of Queen and Bishop and not only that say you know he plays Knight c3 and castles queenside hasn't he got just an ideal position for playing something like knight e4 then so actually I started wondering with some regrets now and this regret you know lasted I think more than an hour actually uh, why didn't on, on earth did I not investigate bishop b4 check more 
so it was at least like an hour into the game. I was thinking I was trying to retrace back to the bishop b4 line, but um, let's have a look objectively with the help of an engine. What was going on here? Was d4 a terrible move? It's not the first choice. Knight a3 is actually mentioned. And I've seen this in blitz against IMs. Sometimes they play this, I think, for knight c4, and that's quite annoying. If you castle here, knight c4, and white's actually got something, a small advantage. If you can get that bishop sometimes, just taking the bishop. This isn't so hot, but you know, maybe there's some dynamic play here. So knight a3 is interesting. But this d4 gives black actually the advantage. Uh, I was right to take, apparently. So there is another option, queen e7. Apparently that's not as technically strong from an engine point of view. White well, might just be able to play either d takes here or knight e2, where the advantage for black isn't that great. But So let's have a look at e takes d4. Now is this actually a crushing position for black? So he played, instead of bishop d4 or ed, he played bishop takes c6. And apparently bishop b4 check, from an engine point of view, there isn't actually technically much difference between d takes c6 at depth 19 and bishop b4 check. And the reason is this basically, that bishop b4 check, there's c3 as I had looked at briefly, d takes, bishop takes, bishop takes, knight takes. And the difference is without the pawn on d4, that actually makes d takes c less attractive here. Because then my, my casting rights be knocked out. There's queen takes d8. And although this might be better uh, for black, you know, these are double pawns. This isn't really a full pawn up. White has some compensation here. It's quite simplified. And the advantage isn't really a big deal at 0 0.39. So the bigger problem for me, though, during the course of the game was the emotional regret and thinking back on the earlier position. So I don't know really how to have solved that. Maybe I should have just wait, you know, wasted or used up half an hour in retrospect just to convince myself that actually it wasn't so crushing because of that situation where queen takes d8 was going to happen. Because I was just carrying now this regret in the game continuation that I've missed an opportunity. Okay, so let's go on anyway. So in this position, I played queen e7 not routinely castling. Now he plays knight f3, which I thought was a bit strange, because what about just knight c3 and just getting on with casting queenside? This battery would seem ideally set up. Bishop g4, and he plays knight d2, and it looks as though white's got a pleasant position. And it annoyed me, and he's even got the possibility of knight c4 uh, to attack the bishop. So I didn't think I was any better now. Engine point of view here, it's it's indicating as though this is better for black for some reason. Even in this continuation. So even after after knight f3, the engine preferred move is bishop f5 actually to attack c2. But uh, bishop f5 actually did occur soon. But first I kicked the queen. After check I played c6. I wanted to try and maybe further embarrass the queen at some point later. But he plays now h3 as though he's making way for his queen to come across to h4. Well, it'd be useful to try and maybe inflict more structural damage onto my king side later. I play b5 here to avoid this queen being parked on h4, knowing that he's either got queen a5 or queen a6, and from there it might be useful to resume that battery of bishop and queen. He'd actually played queen a5. And now I do go back to f5 actually, instead of bishop h5, I attack c2. And after queen c3, I really was unattracted with the idea of walking into this battery. And I thought the battery could be emphasized. I looked at castling and then e4. And here, you know, I can't do knight takes because I'll splat, I'll get mated. But maybe, you know, not e4 straight away, sorry, the king's in the center. If um, he just castles queenside here, what do I do about the impending e4? I really thought white was uh, doing well here. 
engine point of view here white um, is still worse even in this position it seems given uh, an extra move maybe e4 is, is not effectual because I had dislodged the battery first before taking on e4 and that should be safe enough okay so maybe I was a bit unduly concerned about e4 possibilities and in this position I played a rather odd looking move okay I didn't actually just castle I I wanted um, to address this battery issue which maybe wasn't such a major issue so I played actually rook g8 intending actually to castle queenside so he castled queenside and I castled queenside and now he plays rook hg1 and it looks as though you know white will force through e4 anyway after bishop c7 he did in fact play e4 because it looks far too dangerous really uh, to take this I'll be walking into a pin on my queen so say knight takes uh, say rook takes um, king takes bishop takes I think you know knight d2 to be followed by f3 doesn't look didn't look to me during the game as that pleasant but let's let's do a truth detector let's put an engine on here to see is e4 actually is it better than white for white I suspect it is e4 is one of the bad moves there's also b4 considered but e4 the engine again is not afraid of knight takes e4 funny enough so in knight takes e4 this line taking the king bishop takes e4 I guess there's always a check in any case so that's that's not true um now hold on a sec knight d2 ah pinning the knight you see I hadn't gone this far to look at this pin and now after f3 to play bishop f4 so that does backfire on white and if rook takes e4 now there's bishop takes d2 attacking the queen so this is why maybe I could have taken the pawn then apparently so my calculation isn't that great remember this is a two hour game 40 moves it's a big big game maybe you know these things do require detailed calculation so objectively it seems knight takes e4 it is actually playable blimey so anyway I, I just I was a chicken here I played actually Bishop g6 but I still thought okay hang on what is he gonna do here do the damage knight e5 I play to protect the c6 pawn now and he takes on g6 and he carries on moving pawns I thought creating another weakness potentially but he's gonna play e5 at leisure here I didn't really like this position that much but I thought hang on at least in this position I've got a simple idea now finally of just doubling rooks so rook d7 just to double the rooks and maybe exert pressure later on e4 somehow f4 and I double rooks and then he plays e5 giving me a seemingly very nice pleasant knight on d5 but in exchange for that white has also gained space for a potential knight e4 once the queen moves so it moves to f3 and I think white has attained uh, the advantage here white's now better in this position so this was a bit of a struggle this game or is it is it about equal I thought white was better but apparently black's still doing okay with knight b4 being mentioned I thought knight b4 was ineffectual actually attacking a2 I thought um, for some reason that this was ineffectual now what was the reason I'm attacking a2 so if king moves there's rook takes d2 so that's out of the question if a3 kicking the knight still there's check and rook takes d2 so the engines are very keen on these d2 related tactics and all sorts of variations in this game so okay so even knight b4 was playable amazing so I played bishop a5 which looked good to me at the time um, maybe with the idea of knight b4 later okay and he plays now c3 blocking in his own bishop so I put move the bishop back and I have this idea of you know maybe I can 
encourage knight e4, play c4 to squash that bishop, and if knight d6 to play an exchange sack. I had the idea here because I was thinking about peace quality uh, related exchange sacks. Um, Michael actually showed me this brilliant GM game in an earlier round when he had crushed me in an earlier round. He showed me this GM he'd beaten earlier in the year, and he had used this exchange sack to get rid of one of the GM's better pieces. And I'll try and show you that game actually uh, soon, a video, a video annotation of that game. But this kind of exchange sack to me is similar because it will be closing off what was potentially one of White's better pieces and get rid of uh, this new, you know good piece on d6 and liberating this one. So I thought the idea behind the exchange sack wasn't so bad here. Um, but I was slightly worried in this position. What if you know white plays c4? Uh, because actually there's this pin on this diagonal. If knight b5 surely there's c takes. I was a bit worried uh, about this position even with the idea of knight d3 check because I'm still threatened with b takes and taking the rook. But I wonder, you know, maybe maybe there's just knight takes e1 here. So let's engine check this move now, which I was worried about, c4. Was there any actual put the truth detector on the engine on this one? c4. What's the truth behind c4? In fact, it seems to be black is apparently better in this line with the check. And in fact, yes, knight takes e1, always attacking the black queen in these variations. So not m m minding about losing material oneself, as long as you can attack the opponent's queen. So that would be absolutely crushing a white here. So there was no need to worry about c4. For, for some time during the opponent's turn, I was worried about c4. When in fact, it seems knight b4 is absolutely adequate against this, uh, this pinned pawn. Okay, if so, anyway, I made provision after I was delighted that he actually played king b1. I thought, well, he's given me a chance now to prepare for c4 with a6, just reinforcing b5. And now he goes in for knight e4 for the knight d6 check. So we transpose into the earlier idea I had of wanting to do this exchange sack. So I want to crush my opponent's highest quality pieces. And also improve the quality of my pieces. I thought that's a relatively firm foundation for a uh, sort of intuitive uh, positional exchange sack. So c4, after knight d6, I just snap it off. And I was pleased with my position here. And he had used up a lot of time, um, actually, so far. And I had to uh, play quite a few moves from here at move 28 to make sure he can get to move 40 safely to get an extra hour. Okay, he takes on c4, which I was pleased with, because maybe after retaking I can use the b file. He plays h4 now, which I was wondering about. What, what is he trying to do? Undouble my pawns. What's the advantage of undoubling these pawns? And I thought, actually, you know, if he undoubles my pawns, he gets access to e5. He gets access to attack f7. Okay, I thought, don't, don't panic. Just play king a7. Just try and use the b file. So he plays h5. And after rook d7, he's actively undoubling my pawns. But he's gaining a bit of space now with f5. I play queen d6, thinking that's better than queen f6 because the queen can maybe come over here if needed to exert pressure on that b file. g4, and I start exerting pressure on the b file. He evacuates a bit, safety, king a1, away from potential dangers lurking. Queen c5, ready to you know, put a battery with a queen in front, which is not ideal. But the queen there could go there, maybe. And then bishop a5, maybe I can put pressure on c3. But um, he now prepares a counter sacrifice. He plays rook e5, using the pin on the knight to forcefully give back the exchange. I thought, well, hold on, he's going to undouble these pawns. So big deal, I'll let him, un you know, give back the exchange. So I play f6. He gives back the exchange for pawns, so now we're again equal on material. It's about equal, actually, the position. I play a check, and I play queen h2 with a tiny bit of pressure, but objectively, um, it should be equal. Engine point of view here, I think it's just equal. It's all equal material. This bishop, although it looks bad, it's equal, this position. But we're approaching move 40 with him desperately short of time. 
He plays bishop a3, and after queen c2, which looks impressive, he could have just played rook c1 here, as the engine suggests, just protect this c3 pawn and evict the queen. But no, what he does is a move 40 blunder. He plays queen d5, giving me c3. So after all the events of the game, now I find myself a pawn up after move 40. So we each get basically an extra hour's allocation. So can I convert this extra pawn? So now we're doing another game, basically starting from here. How do I convert the extra pawn? I play queen b4, hoping uh, that I'm not going to run into trouble myself from the b-file or nasty diagonal usage. And surely I've got rook c7 to support that c-pawn if needed. So he attacks, I defend that c-pawn, bishop c3, and now queen b5. I don't mind connecting my pawns, queen e6. I suddenly thought, hold on a sec. This could be unpleasant if I go for a queen exchange like this. He could take like this, and this pawn would be a menace if he supports it. Surely it would be a bit of a menace. I don't really want to do that. I want to evict that queen away from there safely. So I thought queen c5, actually, queen c5 keeps hold of you know the diagonal, the c pawn, and also prepares eviction notice with rook e7. So he plays queen e2 here, thinking, I'm thinking now, actually, maybe his idea is queen b2, and start to put pressure on, on my b6. And I gain a lot of space now with my queen, with finding this next move. So not queen e3, which I thought wasn't that great, because queen b2. I play instead queen f2. I don't mind the queens coming off. He avoids the queens coming off. And I gain even more space with a more central queen, with queen e3. Stopping him from playing rook b1 and other stuff. Rook c2. Now even more space, I thought. Queen d3. So I, you know, and I look at this line, which which looks attractive. C takes, takes, and then here I'd have D2 winning because of that pawn. Um, so I thought, yeah, this is this is really good now. Queen D3. So he plays Queen C1, and I play Bishop D4 now, hoping you know if I get the bishops off, this is this should be easier. There'll be less counterplay. He plays Queen B2. I thought, hold on, I can't, can I really win that after bishop c3? And another move comes to mind here, actually. Uh, the idea that I really want to get rook b7 in, but at the moment I can't because the bishop takes d4 check. Um, and I want to stop rook c1, and I found the move which seemed to be quite dangerous from all these points of view. Which actually, uh, believe it or not, the engine actually likes one of my moves here. Um, if I give you 10 seconds, can you find a move which kind of prepares this threat, uh, maintains that threat? If I give you 10 seconds in this position, so what would you play here as black? And it seems to be engine approved last time I checked. Okay, so 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, I play bishop e3. And this is actually quite an incisive move. This is actually a dangerous move for white in this position. Also, of course, stopping any rook d2s. If we um, if we engine check this position, just to show that, bishop e3, and it's almost like two unit advantage, even though equal on material, because of this menacing threat. But what I didn't see, he played bishop d2, and I didn't see the idea now of retreating the bishop back. I just exchanged on d2, leaving a roughly equal position. But actually, again, if I persist now with maintaining the threat, say with bishop c5, I didn't really, you know, check this out. What if, you know, rook c3, okay, in this position apparently there's bishop d4, so rook takes this, taking, taking on d3. So that's not good. And if bishop c3, then I think I'd finally get my threat in of rook b7. So actually, I didn't persist with the actual tactical idea implied. But here is the idea actually rook b7. That is a strong idea to seize control of that b-file. Now bishop e3 or queen f3, what is going on here? You see, there seems to be implied a big advantage, but is white being run out of moves or something with rook b5 or rook e7? What is actually going on here? Say we choose rook b5, rook b2. 
Why is this still like one and a half unit advantage? Bishop c5 stopping use of queen e7. Is white really running out of moves? Is that the case? A curious position. In this kind of position, it looks as though white's getting increasingly passive. So this is starting to look desperate. Okay. So I'm not really sure w what, you know, that sort of pressure continuation. I, I thought, hold on, after bishop d2, why don't I just simplify here? Less counterplay. So I just took the bishop anyway. Rook takes d2, and I, I thought, get the queens off. And now we enter this rook and pawn in, and I thought, I'll get my king active, start moving that up. And now I thought, if I can get rook e7, this would be really pleasant to drive the king back. He plays rook, so rook e7, uh, g5, and he sort of, uh, you know, plays this gambit to temporarily, you know, double my pawns, and he's going to collect them back. I thought that was a nifty idea, but uh, what about check? Throw that in anyway. I have time to take and collect maybe his f pawn in exchange now for him taking those two pawns. So I go behind the f pawn. So I'm a pawn up only after all that. But now I find at move 62 a plan which I thought was quite convincing. If I get this pawn all the way here. Then I can play a check, then the king goes here, then I can play rook a1. A sort of squeezing metaphor often occurs to me in end games, where you can really squeeze uh, the opponent. There's minimal counterplay from the opponent in rook and pawn endings, and often factors like king activity and how much space you know and quality that the pieces are, they're actually like squeezing the opponent's possibilities out. So this pawn could be playing a squeezing role on a3. So I start moving it towards the a3 square. He plays now king c2, but I still play a3. So I've got my dangerous pawn now. After king b1, I play my plan. I, I win this other pawn, and I thought this would be it. Two pawns up. But uh, is it a theoretical draw? I, I wasn't 100% sure. If I, if I just hit a theoretical draw position or something? Engine says like two here. So actually, I play rook h2, check. He plays rook a8. Let's keep this engine evaluation on. And I really thought I've got to give up my a pawn here. What, what do I do about the a pawn? If I play a2, check, he just plays king a1, I thought. And how do I make progress here? So I thought, hang on, I've got to improve my king quality. So I play a check and give up the a pawn with king c2. So he takes with the rook, which might not be the best because it's gone to minus five there. So apparently rook g8, maybe there's a clinical way for white to defend this. Because it's only minus 1.35 with rook g8. So is this actually winning? Say c3, check. It's even less than one unit now. I think there's just continuous checks. So that someone said all rook and pawn endings are drawn. There is a certain logic to that because it seems sometimes even when two pawns up here, this isn't going anywhere, is it? Because of all these checks, unless one can build a significant bridge, how does black stop all the checks? It's a draw. So I think I have fluffed up somewhere. <laughs> so um, to be quite honest. Uh, as the truth detector shows, but he played king, he played rook takes a3, and apparently I, I'm plus five now. I play c3, so my plans come off, it seems. But now rook h5, okay, that's still plus five. King a3, and now rook b5, which is again blowing it, it seems. <sighs> I thought this was natural to cut the king off and try and get the king, you know, to play c2. Move the king out of the way and play c2. And let's have a look at rook h7. So if the rook moves, then there'll be a check, and then king b2 looks like strong. Uh, so say here, check. I 
Okay, king b2 is actually possible here because if rook c3, then there's check and win the rook with the king. So now the pawn is being dragged. So if the if the rook here cannot move off the a file, let's say it tries to keep on the a file. Now there's now rook c7 or rook b7. So why is that significantly different? Let's go in for the checks again. It's significantly different because now actually there's the possibility of checking like this and king b2 with c2. So that was that seems to be um, a big blunder then this rook b5. Um, so with rook h7 instead it keeps the flexibility therefore of these checks once the rook leaves the a file. So these rook and pawn endings are quite subtle. So a difference here of, of five units here between playing rook b5, which is what I apparently played, <laughs> unfortunately. So there's technically a draw for the perpetual checks with um, that being less significant here, with rook a5 being less significant uh, because the rook's actually attacked. So there's no time. Uh, this is equal. So this key move creates flexibility for the rook checks on the a file to play rook h7. So rook b5 was a blunder. But thankfully, you know, he's running out of time now. He's this is into the last hour of the extra extended time control. So thankfully he he blunders uh soon quite badly. But let's keep the engine on here uh to examine what he played. So rook h8 not terrible at the moment. Rook e5 as I'm trying to build a bridge. Check. And he could have just carried on instead of there even check but king b3 is adequate check now to hold the draw king a3 or king c2 I think just holds a draw or does it let's say king a2 no c2 it looks as though black is making progress or is is that not the case doesn't seem to be the case does it can I get behind the rook there's always rook h1 now so that would be a draw so basically I think I was gifted a point which it should have been a draw oh dear oh dear oh dear I was just gifted a point here instead of king a3 or king a2 uh, he just gives me the game basically he plays king a4 now after rook b8 I can look forward to um, the checks I can answer with just getting my king over here and shield the checks so he cracked in the end so here it's it's gone he he resigned here I'm just going to answer the check with c2 so that was a bit tricky how to how to mess up when two pawns are up so this was the final position so that was a bit of a dramatic uh, round five uh, so technically this is actually not as easy as it would seem this situation it, we need to put this into a table base just to check maybe the exact configuration of, of where the kings are um, but it looks as though this is tricky this position so even in this position I think here a flexible move might be uh, rook h7 in this position with the kings opposite each other king d2 is given actually if we extend this is rook h7 possible as well so this is a winning position here with with several moves actually king d2 and now there's the possibility of rook b1 check to kick the king out and c2 that's just winning easily so king d2 what does white do here so where was the fluff up just so you guys can potentially avoid this in this position rook h5 is not yet fluffing up but after king a3 
it seems in this position even just king c1 or king b1 apparently even king b1 so say check and now king c1 and now here even rook d5 I think the checks are going to run out there's going to be rook d2 for that bridge no it looks tricky again it looks tricky again so there is a way of winning this rook and pawn ending with that opposition here so rook h5 okay so rook b5 is is, a, is apparently a blunder so instead rook h7 looks much more useful uh, with the idea now of, of check and king b2 if the rook ever moves off the a file So these rook and pawn endings, I don't know. So, um, so a dramatic game. Uh, so I was let off the hook at the end. I was gifted an extra half point more than I should have um, in the final uh, blunder with King A4, unexplainable. But no, not totally unexplainable. It was down to about two minutes on his clock. But let's go through that game again. So it was a bit of a dramatic game where I, for about an hour after this opening sequence, I was in regret. I was actually thinking, actually, you know, computers don't have regret for what's happened in the past. I, I wanted to shake off the regret and try and get the advantage again. You know, I tried really hard to try and extract an advantage from this position. I thought I had one potentially after bishop f5. So maybe I didn't need to fear just naturally just castling if the tactics were okay. So we end up both casting on the queen side. And I actually had this idea after fluffing up earlier that this game will be the last finish of the round and lo and behold it was actually the last game in the open section to finish in round five uh, so that's just the way it went so there's an about an hour of regret after an inaccuracy um, a seemingly attractive exchange sacrifice to try and wrest some advantage but objectively with the counter exchange sack especially coming up he again equalized then there was the move 40 blunder giving me a pawn then I thought again I was getting the advantage with these space gaining maneuvers making my queen better quality than his queen and then this rook bishop e3 seemed to give me a sort of winning rook b7 which he answered now resourcefully bishop d2 then we have a seemingly pleasant rook and pawn ending which um, I go I'm a pawn up and I managed to go two pawns up but uh, and I thought I found found a winning plan for rook a1 to get a second pawn and that would be it but he found resistance and it seems as though technically I've blundered in this rook and pawn ending when I played rook b5 here so rook h7 not rook b5 to to keep the pain going you know if the rook moves then king b2 and if he ever takes on c3 with the king here then then the check would win the rook as we saw so rook h7 no but I played rook b5 um, and the damage might be done actually after rook h8 it might be difficult to to get back uh, potentially maybe you know it becomes drawn with an inaccuracy uh, so thankfully um, he just blunders at the end it's I guess that's the way it goes sometimes comments or questions on YouTube I hope you got something from that thanks very much